and I've been involved with uh, with acupuncture for more than 20 years. And uh, and with cancer, uh, I worked at the Shar Cancer Center at Anova in uh, in Fairfax, Virginia, for a couple of years, and. Um, I got to see a lot of interesting things. I started out my career actually as, a, as an aerospace engineer and I didn't feel satisfied with the things that we were doing. Uh, even though it's intellectually stimulating, I just felt like uh, it, it wasn't warming my heart. And so I changed careers and became an acupuncturist. And I haven't looked back since. And I've been very happy with uh, just helping people heal. And uh, so I was going to do a PowerPoint presentation, and I thought that that sounds a little bit too much like a lecture where um, I'm speaking and people are listening. And I thought instead it would be better if I were to share my clinical experience with you and you guys could share your experience with acupuncture, Qigong, and Tai Chi with me. So even though the title says Qigong and acupuncture, actually Tai Chi is the little sister of Qigong. And uh, I wanted to talk about that too, because you don't want to leave that out. So, so uh, to start out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about acupuncture and then talk about Qigong and then talk about Tai Chi. And we're gonna have about a five minute break in 45 minutes. I set my alarm for that just so that people can grab some tea and relax for five minutes and then come on back and, and just uh, get ready to uh, go again. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, I'm going to demonstrate some Qigong stuff that you can do at home and uh, some resources on uh, how you can find a Qigong uh, practitioner or, or place to learn uh, locally. So to start out with acupuncture, um, I am a, a nationally board certified acupuncturist and people in social settings will ask me, well, do you, do you go to school for that? And uh, the answer is yes, you know, we do go to school for that. And, um, and it's typically four years of undergrad, although I've heard that there's some schools that will allow 60 credits to let you in. But for the most part, you do four years of undergrad and then uh, about a year of medical prerequisites if your background is not in, uh, in biology. And then three years of school for acupuncture, uh, two years of school for herbology or Chinese pharmacology and a year of internship. And sometimes you can do the didactic with the internship at the same time. And uh, you know your life will be busy, but uh, it's, it's, it's doable. In China, uh, you get MD at the end of your training in traditional Chinese medicine, uh, just like a Western medical route. And you do rotations at hospitals. So you will do uh, orthopedic rotations and surgical rotations and psych rotations and neurological rotations. So by the time you graduate, you've seen quite a bit. And that's different from uh, here in the United States where we typically have a clinic uh, where we operate out of at the, at the uh, school and then people just come in and whoever comes in is what you get to see. So uh, in my year of internship, I did not see a single cancer patient. I did not see a single person that had Parkinson's disease. And so when I graduated, I felt like there were areas of weakness in my training that have since been improved across the country and that there are schools that have uh, relationships with hospitals and that there's actually rotations and hospital systems now, which is, which is great. And also the VA has opened up, DOD has some other um, opportunities as well. So uh, how many of us are in the United States? There's uh, 38,000 of us that practice in the US. We have 60 uh, accredited schools throughout the nation and they're distributed unevenly where uh, because California is a large state, there's I think nine schools in, uh, in California. Uh, there's about six schools in Florida. And so there are quite a few of us. There's more than a thousand of us practicing in Florida. There are more than 18,000 of us practicing in California. Um, here in Virginia, we have something close to 400 practitioners. In Maryland, because there was a school there, the, the Maryland practitioners are up around a thousand. So there's quite a few of them there as well. We're licensed in uh, 47 states. 
So there are still three states that uh, we're not licensed in, but there are states that people don't want to live in anyway, the North Dakota and South Dakota. I'm trying to think of what the, the final state is that's uh, not allowing. I think it might be, uh, might be Louisiana, but I'd, I'd have to double check. Anyway, so, uh, so what exactly is acupuncture? So acupuncture is, uh, is using very fine needles that are about four times the diameter of human hair. They're used once and discarded. They're in uh, individually sterile packages. And, um, and they're flexible like a cat's whisker. So you almost can barely see it and you might be able to see how it flexes when I, I touch it. And uh, uh, people uh, tend to be scared of needles, but uh, typically it feels like a mosquito bite or, or even less. And you can see I've got a tube here and that's, that's what it looks like uh, when it's in. So it's, it's uh, not too scary. If you notice when I removed it, there's not even a drop of blood because the needle is so small that the skin seals itself back up when you remove the needle. Um, there, there are some times when you may bleed if, uh, if you touch a capillary or something like that, but, um, but it's a pretty painless procedure. Um, when you hear needle, you think about uh, giving blood. And whenever I give blood, I'm counting sealing tiles, but um, but all I'm thinking about is a square inch of skin. They're going to jab me with the needle, and uh, and so most of my patients are almost um, disappointed when I put the needle in, and they say, "Wait, it's in?" I said, "Yep, that's it." And they said, "I didn't feel anything." Yeah, yeah. So that's not unusual. Um, it, there are parts of our bodies that have pain receptors very close together on our hands. Uh, where if I were to put a needle anywhere on the palm of your hand, it, it wouldn't feel very good. The same is true for the bottoms of our feet. But luckily, we don't use those points all that frequently. Um, thank God for small favors. So um, I'd like to see a show of hands uh, just to see who has experienced acupuncture here in the room. Alice, I see Lynn. And Lynn, would you like to share your experience? Um, I had acupuncture several years ago. And so I knew what it was about. And then it was recommended when I was uh, recovering from cancer treatment. And um, actually Reed was my acupuncturist through Life with Cancer. and. Um, I don't, I don't know that I can say it really helped, but I don't think it hurt. And I think having another supportive complementary treatment maybe just helped me um, um, feel cared for on my path to recovery. Gotcha. And and what uh, what symptom did you have that you were you were trying to abate? I had um, some residual peripheral neuropathy from chemotherapy, mm -hmm. and some tightness from radiation therapy, and um, just overall um, feeling like I wasn't um, wasn't yet fully recovered, so to speak. Understood. And I'd have to say that, uh, that peripheral neuropathy is, is pretty stubborn. And, uh, and the way that the, they've got it set up is they just looked at the studies and found that usually we can impact it within six treatments. And so they kind of use six treatments as the, uh, as the bar. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what uh, integrative oncology is. Is, um, is there anyone who could um, throw out a guess or, or does anyone in the room know exactly what integrative oncology is? So I'll, I'll give you what, uh, what, what the Society of Integrative Oncology defines it as. They say that it's a, a patient-centered, evidence-informed field of cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products and or lifestyle modifications 
from different traditions alongside conventional cancer treatments. Integrative oncology aims to optimize health, quality of life, and clinical outcomes across cancer care uh, continuum and to empower people to prevent cancer and become active participants before, during, and beyond cancer treatment. So that's pretty long-winded, but if you look at most uh, of the oncology centers in the country, like MD Anderson, they offer acupuncture, qigong, tai chi, yoga, music therapy, art therapy, and a whole host of other, what you could call, um, integrative approaches and uh, massage. We can't forget massage. And uh, when I get into the Tai Chi and Qigong part, I'll talk about how it's more than just exercise. And that studies demonstrate that, you know, the amount of calories burned can be equivalent between two practices. And yet one has an incredible effect on our bodies and the other one is just exercise. So it's, uh, it's definitely interesting. So what can, what can acupuncture do for, uh, for cancer patients? We uh, can deal with the side effects of chemotherapy, radiation, and, uh, and also hormonal therapies uh, that include pain and hot flashes, uh, peripheral neuropathies, and xerostomia, which is the big word for dry mouth due to head and neck cancer radiation. Uh, fatigue, which is a real huge one. Um, I ended up writing a, uh, a literature review or something called a narrative review uh, for uh, Life with Cancer, and I'd hold it up, but I think it would come out backwards. Yeah, um, and um, it's, uh, I looked at 155 papers and uh, and narrowed it down to 45 that were within the past six years that had a decent amount of, of people involved and, um, and then summarized it so that uh, not only is there the study design and sample size, I wanna make sure the sample size is high, you know, I was hoping to get at least 50 patients or more, a control arm, frequent frequency, um, follow-up length, intervention, et cetera, and a conclusion, of course. So um, I didn't wanna bore people to tears with diving into the research aspect of it, but um, I thought that I would just do one paper per, uh, per uh, condition, and uh, that way it, it, uh, you know, people will hopefully still be awake. Um, let's take fatigue, for instance. Um, there's a randomized control trial uh, with uh, 300 people, and uh, they just had it uh, acupuncture once a week for four weeks. Uh, they also, the control arm was a usual care. So they split them into two groups. And the group that had acupuncture, uh, the conclusion was it's effective uh, intervention for managing cancer related fatigue uh, and also improving patients quality of life. And so when people do get uh, chemo, they're just, they're couch bound. It's just, it's really, it really beats you up and acupuncture really helps perk them back up um, in, in a way that uh, just, it makes them a little more functional. Insomnia and sleep disturbance is another big one that uh, is affected by, uh, by cancer treatment. And uh, acupuncture, again, is very, very effective at that. And um, without going through incredible detail, um, there's a systematic review uh, where there's 475 patients and uh, six randomized controlled trials uh, that basically said that, uh, that acupuncture is superior to sham and a sham acupuncture is where you put the needle not where the acupoint is, but at a bogus point. And so um, the way the researchers are sometimes structured is almost like a drug. And that, um, in the, that would be the placebo control is putting the needle where it's not supposed to be. And so in the patients where the needle is put where it's supposed to be, um, there's a very positive outcome. And so they definitely say that, uh, that acupuncture is great for that. And the way it works is that it stimulates your brain to produce more serotonin and serotonin breaks down into melatonin and melatonin is what helps you sleep. That makes sense. So there's some sleep aids like melatonin, but I found that it doesn't really work as well as acupuncture. Um, my patients just don't have, they tend to get restless. 
Um, I heard it's really great for, for jet lag, but I find that, um, that the melatonin itself isn't very great. For those of you who are on the call that do have insomnia issues, I would recommend trying uh, 5-HTP. It stands for hydroxytryptophan, and it's a precursor to melatonin. And that tends to work pretty well, and there's very few side effects, uh, as opposed to Ambien, where if you take it too late in the evening, you uh, may drive your car into a wall, which is pretty dangerous. Hot flashes is another thing that acupuncture is very effective for, not only for uh, menopausal folks, but also for people who are undergoing um, undergoing hormonal treatments and that um, men have experienced hot flashes and their wives are so thrilled that, that they uh, know what they're going through. But um, so I, I deal with both men and women with uh, hot flashes. And uh, again, the bottom line is that uh, it says that it helps with the frequency and the intensity of, uh, of the hot flashes. Peripheral neuropathy, of course, we just spoke about that. And uh, peripheral neuropathy, again, is a side effect of, uh, of chemotherapy, and that it tends to affect the peripheral areas primarily, so that's hands and feet. And in some uh, protocols, they will uh, put ice bags on the hands and feet, and also on the head, because if the chemotherapy can't get to the hair follicles, then your hair won't fall out. And the same thing is true. If the chemotherapy can't really get to the hands and feet, then there seems to be a less of an effect on the nerves there. And so um, it can be numbness, tingling, burning sensation. Uh, there's a whole host of things where people can't even drive because they can't feel the pedals under their feet. And you can imagine how frightening that is. And also balance because we have interoceptors, we have proprioception, which is where we know where we are in space. And, and actually, actually she, 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 she gone 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 is, is, will affect that properly. So it can improve that condition. So um, people have found that their balance really goes poorly, and especially when it's dark, that uh, they can fall down. And again, uh, says here that um, acupuncture is more effective than using B1 or gabapentin as the conventional treatment is one of the studies that uh, said. And so sometimes they pit us, or the control group will be a drug, for instance. Uh, dry mouth is another one. And again, acupuncture is very, very effective at dealing with that. And uh, strangely enough, the acupoint is located right here, the, the one that's most uh, effective for, uh, for, for dry mouth. Pain is huge, obviously, and if you have a if you have a tumor that's displacing tissue, then um, then that's hard to treat with acupuncture because um, you've got tissue and nerves that are being stepped on. And so, uh, but there are aromatase inhibitors that cause joint pain and all kinds of pain throughout the body, and that uh, that's something that uh, that acupuncture can definitely help with. Uh, there's one study where it says women with aromatase inhibitor induced arthralgias, arthralgias, uh, any kind of uh, joint inflammation, um, found that they had improvement in joint pain and stiffness, and that was not seen with the sham acupuncture. Again, be powerful. Uh, another thing that uh, happens with uh, chemotherapy is that um, white blood cells tank. And our white blood cells are the center for our immune systems. So if, if they go bad, then you have a very good chance of, of getting ill or anyone that's exposed to you that is sick, then you'll get sick as well. And acupuncture helps considerably with improving white blood cell production throughout the body. And, uh, and the name for that is leukopenia or neutropenia, depending on which white blood cell count is as well. And, uh, and there, there weren't really a ton of studies on this particular part. Um, but the good news is that uh, someone did a meta-analysis, which means they're looking at groups of studies. And it says here that uh, yeah, acupuncture ameliorates chemo-induced glucopenia, uh, white blood cells and neutrophil values uh, significantly increased after, uh, after the acupuncture uh, in patients undergoing chemotherapy. Uh, so that's in your and uh, a lot of oncologists are concerned about the safety of acupuncture, and uh, we have a quite an impressive safety record. Um, there are some things that if you are incompetent, that you can uh, poke someone's lung and you can puncture the person's lung. 
But if you know, which sounds frightening, and it is, but if you know what you're doing and you know where your the lung is, you're just not going to puncture people's lungs. Uh, physical therapists that are doing dry needling, unfortunately, have punctured quite a few people's lungs, and there's there's some uh, malpractice suits uh, due to that uh, mistake. So uh, we're going to move on to um, to talk a little bit about uh, qigong, and want to ask the group if there's anyone here who's uh, who's tried qigong or experienced it or have any friends? So Ms. Vinnegan, would you like to uh, to share? Uh, I've only tried it once. It was through another, um, not life with cancer, but kind of the same idea, but at Virginia Hospital Center. And it was amazing. It, it was just an intro and a uh, lady, you know, led us through a session. I, I don't even know what you call it. And it just was, so calming and wonderful and connecting and beautiful and I want more. Nice, nice. Is there anyone else you'd like to share? Okay, so um, yeah, I, I've been studying on and off Qigong for about 30 years now. I'm not a master, but I, I definitely have been introduced to quite a few techniques and, uh, and we'll do a couple of the simple ones tonight. And so Qigong, Actually, so uh, acupuncture goes back 3,500 years, roughly, depending on the historians that will, you know, that are writing the literature. Uh, Qigong goes back 80 centuries, so it goes back a full 8,000 years, and uh, it was a uh, an oral tradition, and uh, and it was developed by the Taoists, and the Taoists were folks who. Um, the, the Confucianists would say, oh, they're just farmers, you know, what do they know? Um, but they knew quite a lot and they would um, live their lives in the rhythm of nature. And so they believed that if you do, then your health and well-being is going to be better. And so that the foundations of traditional Chinese medicine are rooted in a Taoist philosophy. And so um, there are more than a thousand styles of of uh, Qigong, whereas Tai Chi, for instance, there's five major styles that are around um, in China, and then there are some offshoots of that, but uh, there's not nearly as much as, as the Qigong uh, practices. And you can have similar to yoga, where you can have uh, the like Hatha yoga, where you have this, <clears throat> I'm going to hurt myself. Um, you know, doing static postures, and then they have dynamic postures as well. And the same thing is true for Qigong, is that you have some that are static postures, like a post that we're going to do a little bit uh, later that looks like hugging a tree, you're just holding. And, um, and then you have uh, moving postures as well in a very smooth and rhythmic way that um, that involves the breathing. And uh, of course, the, in different traditions, like in uh, the Indian tradition, they call it prana, as far as the breathing goes. Um, in uh, Qigong, there are very many different breathing techniques where you place your tongue just behind your front teeth on your hard palate. And that connects the Dew and the Ren meridians, which sounds strange, but scientists have found that in fact, that's the case. And then it helps you circulate energy, which is pretty interesting. And so um, researchers consider Qigong as a, a mind-body integrative exercise or intervention from traditional Chinese medicine. It's used to prevent and cure ailments um, uh, to improve health and energy levels through regular practice. Um, there's a couple different types of, of Qigong. You have Qigong, well, what's the word? Qi is energy and Gong is effort. Energy, effort, energy, work. Uh, if you look at um, uh, Tai Chi, for instance, that Qi is like a homonym in their language. So it's a different character. So Tai Chi means supreme ultimate. And Tai Chi Chuan, Chuan means fist, so supreme ultimate boxing. And so uh, whereas uh, Qi Gong breaks into three categories, one of which is internal, and that would be used just for generalized health and well-being. 
there is a medical qigong where you are sending energy from your palms into the patient to heal them, similar to Reiki, if you guys are familiar with the Japanese healing style of Reiki. And then uh, the third type is, um, is for uh, martial uh, arts and in, it just being able to uh, become stronger and more powerful and your techniques more. So uh, those are the three types. Uh, they've actually done some interesting studies with medical Qigong on uh, in vitro and in vivo. Now, if you say, well, what's the difference between the two? You've heard of in vitro fertilization. And so in vitro means inside the human body. In vivo means more like a Petri dish where you have cells in there. And so they did studies where Qigong masters were sending their energy in and cancer cells slowed down or died. And the thing that's unique about that is that cancer cells do not have apoptosis, or some people will say apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So they, they don't die. And in theory, cancer lives forever. And so uh, Qigong masters can inhibit the growth of, of cancer. I see an arm wave. So please, Marie. If, did you have a question? I, I saw the hand wave. Um, oh, okay, well, if you wanna pop back up, please do. Uh, so, I, so Qigong masters can send energy into a Petri dish, can send energy into uh, the human being, and also they've done animal studies and found that they can slow down um, uh, the, the progression of cancer in animal studies. And um, let's see if I've got that over here. Interesting, here we go. Um, so Qigong groups showed more improvement or a better survival rate than conventional methods alone. The in vitro studies report that inhibitory effects of qi emission on cancer growth and in vivo studies found that Qigong treated groups have significantly reduced tumor growth or longer survival among cancer infected animals. And so this is measurable and that uh, there are studies where if you tear a ligament or a tendon or a muscle, your body heals itself. If you cut your skin, you know, it'll bleed, but then the platelets will, will clog up and, and uh, clot area and, and close up the skin. That's your body healing in action. Well, what they found is that when they measured, first of all, when they measured the action of healing, they found that there was a magnetic field produced because of these electrons moving in the skin and that magnetic field could be measured. And you may have heard of the, the natural, the frequency spectrum, which goes from ULF, ultra low frequency to, to very high frequency. Um, and uh, visible light is in there, infrared light is in there, which is heat, but you don't see it. Um, and what they found is that there's a narrow band of frequency that your body heals itself. And when they measured the energy off of the Qigong master's hands, that's the exact frequency band that was coming out. So it really is healing energy that they're sending into their body, which is pretty impressive. And uh, so there's a, a Qigong cancer care, a systematic review uh, and construct analysis. And uh, so they looked at um, over 800, uh, 800 individuals and they said Qigong therapy was found to have positive effects on cancer specific quality of life, fatigue, immune function, cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone of uh, individuals with cancer. So um, it's not just feeling better that there are actual measures and, and blood markers of stress that they've looked at and that um, have changed when a patient practices Qigong. Uh, there's, for instance, there's something called HRV, which is a, um, which has to do with um, heart rate variability. How you think that your heart is like a metronome and when you've seen boom, boom, 
of them, that you, that peaks should be exactly the same. And what you found out, what you find out is that in younger people, it's not, they have a higher variability between peaks. And as we age, it becomes less. If you're sick, it becomes less. If you have cancer, it becomes less. If you're highly stressed, it becomes less. And what they found in the research, uh, and, and HRV, that measure is used across the board for athletic measures of success, et cetera, but they found that both Qigong and Tai Chi have positive effects and in increased heart rate variability in patients. So that's pretty cool. And part of it has to do with breathing, is that they found that the that people have a um, natural harmonic of, of breathing and that that is about 5.5 seconds. So if you can slow down your breathing to 5.5 seconds on the average, that that will improve your heart rate variability and help generally overall health and well-being. And when we do the Qigong practice, you'll see that in action about how you may rise and you're inhaling and then you fall and you exhale and you're doing this very slow and smoothly. And then your sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight um, goes down. And then your parasympathetic, your rest and repair and digest system um, comes onto play and, uh, and helps um, you know, get you back into action. And that's obviously when you heal. They did another one where uh, they found that both Tai Chi and Qigong have positive effects on cancer-specific quality of life, fatigue, immune function, cortisol levels, again. So um, a lot of these, uh, these studies kind of repeat themselves. So I was trying to find things like uh, cancer-related fatigue. There was a study with Qigong and they found out that uh, for people with colorectal cancer, um, it improved their quality of sleep and, and activity levels. Um, and they also found that uh, Qigong is really amazing for brain function. And so that's not only true for people that have chemo brain, but also people who have um, some cognitive deficits. And there's a lot of folks these days who are having cognitive decline, um, Alzheimer's, et cetera. And they found a 22% increase in cerebral mean blood flow velocity in their brain. Now, this was a Qigong master, and so I assume that uh, a student may not do as well, but still, you know, 22% uh, improvement is, is quite impressive. Uh, also, for common things like uh, high blood pressure, that um, Qigong was looked at and found that people had essential hypertension, it dropped their blood pressure and catecholamine levels, which is a chemical that's involved with blood pressure. Uh, another question is, um, can, can Qigong make you live longer? And the answer is an unqualified yes. And um, you may have heard of uh, telomeres and telomeres is at the end of the DNA spiral, there's a little piece, this thing, it looks like, the, the scientists always describe it as the end of, when, when you tie your shoelaces at the end of your shoelace. And what happens is that when you're, when your cells divide and divide and divide and divide and divide and divide over a lifetime, that telomere gets shorter. And so when people die of natural causes, it's because the cellular energy for your, your heart and your lungs and your kidneys are such that, that the replication isn't there anymore and you end up just ceasing to live. And they found that telomerase, which is an enzyme that helps support this telomere length, increases when you do both Tai Chi and Qigong. So I bet a lot of you are asking now, well, which one should I do? Should I do Tai Chi or should I do Qigong? And I typically answer my questions with yes. Um, however, Qigong is easier to learn it's simpler. Um, with Tai Chi, there's actually an entire form that you've got to go through and you have to memorize. And there's like 108 uh, movements in one form. The simplest form is 24 form, there's 48, et cetera. And, um, and so I, I've trained in, in those styles and, uh, and it is, it's, it's hard to remember. Uh, you've just got to practice, 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 practice. But uh, once you're done, the uh, value is 
pretty impressive. So there's some things that Tai Chi does that Qigong does not, and that it excels at. But if you were to do the Venn diagram, the Qigong really covers most of the things that uh, the average person would want to improve in terms of their health and well-being. So I would say, you know, definitely consider the, the uh, Qigong. So uh, my phone is about to buzz because it's at the 45 minute mark. So we're going to take five minutes. If you could return at 820, we'll, uh, if, it's, if that's your time zone, and, uh, and then we'll continue and we'll start talking. Uh, I'll answer any questions after the break so you can formulate them. And, uh, and then we'll talk about Tai Chi and then we'll do some Qigong practice. So I'll see you in five minutes. Okay, I hope everyone is uh, properly refreshed and got uh, some tea and something pleasant. And, um, and so uh, how many people here have, uh, have tried Tai Chi? I see a couple hands. Uh, would uh, please, Tracy, tell me tell me what uh, what your experience is. Um, so yeah, so I uh, started doing Tai Chi virtually um, during the pandemic, which was really helpful. Um, and I, you know, I really liked it. I mean, you know, it's it just it helps to you know feel calmer and more centered. Um, however, your point is very well taken about it being, um, I guess, on martial art, and there's a distinct form that you have to learn. Um, and my teacher is, was very kind and very patient. Um, and at the same time, it's like, oh, wait, I did that wrong. Oh, I needed to go this way and not that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people who are good at it, they make it look easy. I Ian? Yeah, I, I take it with the Life with Cancer, the uh, easy Tai Chi. Oh, okay. The regular Tai Chi is, I just can't do that. It's too fast paced and too complicated for me. Uh, understood. Yeah. And you may want to just try to, um, well, you're going to experience some Qigong tonight. And so that way you can get an idea of what it's like and uh, just how simple it is in comparison to, uh, to Tai Chi. Uh, is there anyone else who wanted to uh, pipe up? So, uh, so yeah, I had mentioned before that uh, Tai Chi or Tai Chi Chuan means uh, supreme ultimate or supreme ultimate boxing. Um, it, it only goes back about 800 years. And so it's a relatively new, um, new technique. And that uh, the Chen village, uh, people from the Chen family are the ones who originated Tai Chi and then the Yang families started doing their style and the Wu and the Sun and the Tao. And so those are the, the primary styles of Tai Chi that are promulgated here in the United States. Uh, I've studied both the tai, uh, both the uh, Yang and the Chen styles. And, uh, and they vary considerably. The Chen style is very explosive and you go from being very slow to boom, being very fast and then slow again. And um, and the the yang style pretty much is slow throughout, and the shifting is is very very smooth and careful. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, and uh, and share with you what uh, someone who's really good what what that looks like. So here we go. Share this. Okay. Here. Can everyone see this? No, Bill. You you can't see this right now? No, we just see the tiles. You see the tiles. Oh, that is sad. Okay. Um pause this and it is it is checked that one participant can share oh it is set up so that uh, that i can share yes um well, let's see let me um how about if you try it again 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now this is better. So here we go. So now I assume you guys can see okay. this. Yes, we can. Thank you. There was one more button to click. Awesome. That's great. Okay. So you notice how low she is and the amount of quad strength it takes to do this is really impressive. And it's almost like she's floating. That's grasping the bird's tail, parting the horse's mane. This is called a brush knee. And so each technique has a particular name. It's kind of flowery. That's where the Chinese are. But what you'll notice is how she knows where her center of gravity is at all times. That's grasping the Tai Chi ball. It's called Repulse Monkey. It's called waving arms like clouds. It has such incredible flexibility and strength, but once again, she makes it look very easy. See, look at that kick. That's so impressive. Snake creeps down. Okay, I think you guys saw enough of it, but I just wanted to share what uh, what it looks like. And we'll get back to uh, Donna, can you, can you, uh, let's see, you see new share. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get back to, uh, to where we are. Oh, you can toggle with tab, um, alt tab, or are you on a Mac or PC? All right, no, I'm on a PC. Um, let's see. I have to look at, I have a PC and a Mac open and let's see if you do alt tab at the same time, your thumb on alt and touch tab, you should be able to get back to zoom. Did that not work? 
I'm, I mean, apparently not. We still see your screen. Yeah. Hmm. Can you reduce that? Hmm. Well, there we go. Okay, okay. there yep. we are. There so sorry. Are. Okay, so um, so now at least you saw what uh, what Tai Chi looks like, and um, and it's it's quite amazing what uh, what it can do, uh, and it's just not it's, okay. So when I mentioned. What is it that Taiji can do that Qigong cannot? And uh, the answer is balance. Is that uh, that with with the, the movements that you saw there? And again, it doesn't have to be that that complex. But um, he, you have less falls in seniors due to doing Taiji, and there's also a strengthening component as well, which is equivalent to downhill skiing for 15 minutes if you do Tai Chi for a half an hour. So that's something. Um, there was a study with, uh, with Tai Chi and um, biomarkers in breast cancer survivors. And uh, they, what they did is they did uh, Tai Chi for 12 weeks, three times a week, about an hour for each session. They uh, looked at these things called interleukins, IL-6, IL-8, insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, um, and some other parameters I won't bore you with, uh, glucose, insulin, cortisol, et cetera. And what they found is that, um, that Tai Chi improved all of those and reduced inflammatory markers associated with the side effects of cancer. So pretty impressive. They were looking at a number of studies. And so what I'll do is I'll just summarize very quickly that um, there were about 300 seniors at an independent living community, the risk for falls went, uh, dropped by 55% for the Tai Chi group. And they had another group that was the control that just stretched. And they found that the people who stretched, they fall just as often. So the Tai Chi group really did well in that. Um, under uh, 30 depressed patients, they found out that uh, the depression scores were significantly reduced. Um, with uh, about 120 patients between 60 and 92, uh, they found demonstrated significant improvements in sleep quality, duration and efficiency of the sleep and, uh, and reduced sleep disturbances. And again, a lot of people who are seniors, they have trouble with sleeping. So that's really great. There were about 125 patients that had recovered from heart attacks. And uh, the Tai Chi group found that, uh, that they had decreased in di diastolic blood pressure and heart rate and decreases in systolic blood pressure. Um, what they found is that with the aerobics group, the diastolic didn't drop, but the systolic pressure did. And systolic is the big number and the diastolic is the, is the small number. <coughs> And then uh, finally, there was uh, some osteoarthritis patients, about 72, and they found that there was less pain and stiffness and reported fewer difficulties in physical functioning. So once again, really impressive stuff. So um, again, I think that Tai Chi is, is definitely well worth practicing. And, um, and again, if you you can apply it in a martial way and be extremely dangerous, and uh, it's funny because you know what you're you're going to be fighting someone who's on Valium. I mean, you know, when you're moving that slow, how you know, how can you you do that? But all of the movements can be sped up and uh, and used in a very martial way, and so it's it's definitely a, a dangerous uh, uh, techniques. So uh, what we're going to do now uh, is Excuse I'm me. move you. Excuse oh, me. Please. Before before we move on, Julie had a question in the chat box. Any recommendations for YouTube or Tai Chi and Qigong? Any teachers or videos to try at home? Thank you. Oh, that's a great question. Um, th there's none that I really follow. Um, however, I'm sure there's a ton that are really, really good. My uh, sister turned me on to uh, yoga with Adrian, just this young woman who 
who just gives free yoga and uh, and she's really great and uh, and she's very flexible and it's really cool. So I, I would say um, with the Qigong, it's funny because I was just looking specifically for Qigong practices related to cancer. And I found that there were a few people that were demonstrating that were not what I would consider skilled Qigong practitioners. And it was a little bit heartbreaking. But um, I think that if you watch, you'll see symmetry um, that when someone is practicing, if one hand is higher than the other or something like that, if they just, just I think you can tell the people who are skilled uh, based on just the way they move. And, um, and it'll be a little bit more obvious. I'll check the chat and I'll also um, make sure there's anything else here. Uh, or did. So just what I'm going to send to everyone is just my email address so that if you have any questions post, feel free to email me. And it's accu underscore health at yahoo.com, accu health. And um, I'm going to unplug my computer and we'll move to a different space. I was going to do it out on my deck, but I realized that it's going to be dark and that can be problematic. So you would get the dark Qigong. So um, I'm going to be moving there and then we can start some Qigong. Hello there. I'm very excited to share that my teacher training program is now available. Positive power. Okay, everyone see me quite well? Excellent, excellent. You can hear me okay? Great. Okay, so um, for those of you, I would really like you to, to try this yourself. And, uh, and we're going to start with just, um, just holding our hands about if you're about the width of your head apart. And when you gently push in, I want you to check, see if you feel a force that makes you feel like it's bouncing back. And if you pull your hands away very gently, if you could feel almost rubber bands between your hands, pulling them back. And so uh, the Qigong practitioners call this like a chi ball. And it's just allowing you to focus your energy between your palms. So try that. And uh, if you feel something, that's great. If you don't feel anything, that's okay too. And I'd like that ball to expand to a beach ball. And as it's expanding, you're inhaling. And then let it collapse. And you exhale. If you're feeling pretty good, you inhale and exhale through your nose. If you're not feeling so great, you inhale through your nose and you exhale through your mouth. 
of earth breathing. Also notice where you're breathing. When you inhale, you want your belly to go out. And most people chest breathe. I want you to do the opposite and diaphragmatically breathe. So do a couple more of these. And when you're done, your palms can go down and you can drop your arms. And we'll start with your feet together. And I want you to feel right at the top of your head, a string that's pulling up gently. And so that's aligning your spine. And I want you to feel your body is like clothing on a hanger. And so your body is relaxed, even though you're having this pulling up. And your feet, there's something called the kidney fire and water points on your feet, which are on your heel, right here, and here on your heel, and, your, the, and the, the sole of your feet. And I want you to sink. So that's rooting you into the ground. Meanwhile, you're being pulled up. So relax and get aligned. And then you step out with your left foot. And you go about twice shoulder width. And your feet are parallel like you're on rails, like on a railroad. And the reason is that if your feet are angled outward, the Chinese believe that you are allowing your chi to go everywhere. And that if your feet are cocked inward, that that chi may be too much for your body. And so that's why we have our feet parallel when we're, we're holding. And the first, posture looks like you have a very big belly and you're holding out like this. From the side view, it looks like this. The knees are bent gently and, uh, and your shoulders are relaxed. My shoulders aren't up. My elbows aren't, aren't out. They're, they're relaxed. And so this is a very relaxed posture. Um, for some people who are very fatigued or who have joint pain, then holding their arms up here is just uh, just too much to ask. And so that's why we uh, do it down here. And uh, so take some nice, slow, deep breaths. Your gaze is soft, which means that you're not looking at any particular one thing. If you're wearing glasses, you can remove your glasses. And just feel your body. Just notice that the entire earth, the weight of the, the actual mass of the entire earth is pulling you down because it loves you. And so, you're just feeling the weight on your feet, feeling to see if you have any discomfort in your body. Allowing your breath to be nice and slow and relaxed, your inhale flowing slowly into your exhale. The Chinese will say, part your eyebrows, meaning that you're allowing the tension from your forehead to wash away. In some styles, they'll say to have a slight smile. So instead of just a neutral expression on your face, 
Your lips are slightly curled upwards. Notice if there's any tingling in your fingers and your toes. Notice if you're holding any tension in your body, and if you are, ask it to let go gently. And to end the form, your hands go slightly palm up and then they swing down and you drop them. And you take three slow, deep breaths, following what uh, Lao Tzu said, which is uh, pay as much attention to the end as you do to the beginning. And when you get that third breath, and you bring your left foot in. And you close the form. So um, how did that feel? Does anyone have any uh, thing they want to share with that particular movement or, uh, or feeling? OK, we're going to do one more fun one. And um, if you're familiar with a Tai, uh, well, they, they call it Tai Chi ball, but it's, um, it's the yin yang symbol. So you have a circle that's got the kind of circling fish in it. Does that sound familiar in two dots, the yin yang symbol? Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna finger paint the yin yang symbol and, uh, and what it looks like I'm going to align myself. Step out. And you start at the top and touch your fingers along that Tai Chi. And then as you are going up the side, you've got to switch your fingers, continue the circle. And when you get to the top, it, you're tracing almost an S shape. And again, you switch your fingertips. So the, the yin yang symbol can be any particular size you would like it to be. And what this does, it's not only a meditation and movement, but you're not just doing it with your arm. Notice that I'm just starting out, just doing it with my arm. And some people can place their hand on their hip if it's more comfortable for them. But once you get the painting down, you sink when you get to the bottom and you're inhaling when you get to the top. So exhale, sink. Inhale, rise. A little finger painting. And it's such a shame that we can't be in the same room together to enjoy this. But it's something that you can do at home relatively easily. you can actually do this sitting as well. But the nice thing about standing is that you can allow yourself to rise and fall as you're doing this. A 
So again, you get to the top and it's almost a backwards S. And then you come back up and then it's a forward S shape. Pay attention to your breathing. Or again, you're exhaling on the way down and inhaling on the way back. Do one more. And the palm can go down. And again, you take a couple breaths. And step in. There's something I'm going to demonstrate, but this is not something you would be doing. I just want to make you aware of uh, of one of the types of the qigong. It's called um, it's it's called the, the the teacup exercise, and the way it's done is you picture you have a teacup in the palm of your hand, and you don't want to spill it, so you put the teacup behind your back, and you're swinging it around, still trying not to spill it comes up over your head and then back around. And so that's one circuit. And what this is used for is for sword work when you're using two swords, but it's also so that you can, uh, you have internal, external rotation, adduction, abduction, circumduction, all in one exercise. And I see there's a hand up. So Barbara, please share. I was I, wondering about, sorry to go back to the first exercise. I didn't quite get what you were doing with your left foot. Oh, the left foot was just that I'm stepping out. That's, okay. that's yes. Okay. Yes, and in certain styles, uh, there are in practices where you step out with the right foot. And that uh, there's a special way of doing it too, where you, when you're sinking, your heel comes off the floor and then oh. the ball and then the toe. And then when you step back out, it's toe, ball, heel. So there's a way that we sink into it uh, for this. So getting back to the, uh, the teacup exercise, mm -hmm. I was going this way. Well, you can also go the opposite way where you extend, circle, around, and back, right? So if you want to get your cerebrospinal fluid flow, like if anyone's gone to a, um, a craniosacral therapist, they found that, now I'm gonna do it with both hands. So. You're circling, you're sinking. This is the yin yang symbol. Extension, compression. Extension, compression. So, what's actually happening if you were to take away the hands is that the spine is expanding and then contracting, and that is the optimal uh, circulation for uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And so it also lubricates all the joints because you've got your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders, your spine, people who have osteoarthritis, um, you're also using your knees and your ankles in the process of doing this. But so this is something that, um, you know, is, is a Qigong practice that um, looks a little complex, but when you get it down, it's, um, it's great fun. And, um, you know, and it's incredibly healthy and will allow you to be balanced. I know we're getting pretty close to... Uh, to the end, and I know that Alice would like to uh, to uh, offer up a prayer. And so um, I just like to say thank you for your time and your attention. 
that, uh, that I do practice in Alexandria, Virginia. And so uh, if, if you or any of your friends are interested in, in seeing me, they'll get a $50 off initial evaluation and treatment. Awesome. And you can send me an email and I'd be happy to, uh, to set you up. I actually blocked quite a few uh, uh, slots this week because um, I, I sent this out via Facebook and others and I actually expected about, about 60 to 80 people to uh, participate. So definitely a little less than I had expected, but uh, it's, it's all good. And uh, it's, it's all yours, Alice. Well, thank you, Bill. That, that was splendid. Um, I did take Tai Chi about, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, and I could never get the hang of it. And in contrast to the uh, what the gentleman said about his instructor being patient, mine wasn't. So it was like I I, I felt uh, criticized more than anything, and uh, kind of gave it up. But I really received a completely different view of it with through your presentation, and I'm I'm eternally grateful for that. And also, I did want to mention, um, Bill has been my acupuncturist for somewhere between four and five years now. And I have an S-shaped spine, literally looks like an S. And I know that there are times where I have been, when I do not do what I know is my normal routine maintenance, which is once a month to go for massage once a month, go for acupuncture. And um, that's just normal maintenance for me. Uh, I end up paying a dear price for it because I get an ache, a pain, a bliss of that, you know, and a stiffness and, and everything. But uh, anyway, the I don't know how many flows there are total in the body. M maybe you can answer that. Bill, but my, I think my understanding is about 30 different flows that, that we have. And so acupuncture to me just helps to address so many different points that, you know, where your body, you know, where you have different fluid flowing. So well, anyway. sometimes they say that uh, acupuncture or I'm sorry, Qigong is like acupuncture without needles. Without needles. Interesting. Okay. All right, well, we um, let's we'll do our closing prayer now. So everybody very gently close your eyes. Take a deep breath in and exhale. Dear Mother, Father, God, divine infinite spirit, source of all that is, we thank you so much for the gifted, talented people that we have that cross our path. And we thank you for the particular instruction of Bill Reddy, for he is an amazing healer, a very, very gifted acupuncturist, as well as a Qigong master, or what feels like a Qigong master. We thank you and for the presence of the angels, the archangels, the ascended masters, the Reiki masters, but most especially Master Jesus, Master Buddha, Master Katumi, Saint Francis, Saint Germain, Saint Gabriel, Saint Raphael, Saint Michael, the Blessed Mother, the Divine Feminine, Mary Magdalene, Melchizedek, and Kuan Yin. I ask that we be cleared, centered, aligned, balanced, and grounded, and purified. And we thank you for the presence of Archangel Metatron and his healing angels, and for the highest vibrations of light that they bring through us and to us. And we thank you for the presence of the great rays, the lords and masters of the rays, and the archangels of the rays. We thank you for all of this through the great I am. Amen. Namaste. 
And thank you again, Bill. The presentation was splendid and so wonderfully informative. Well, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure. Great. Thank you. And everybody have a great night. <laughs>